just a week away. So thank you again for um, taking time to listen in to our second webinar of a series that we've been doing looking at youth and young adult tobacco use. My name is Kim Homer Vagadori, and I'm going to be sharing with you guys today some information that we have been learning from focus groups that we've been connect conducting with youth and young adults throughout the state. We've been doing these for quite a number of years, and so we're going to be focusing on some findings that we've had from our 2019 groups, but I'm going to be referencing information as well that we have been collecting since we started these back in 2013. Um, just a couple notes of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being recorded, and so once um, we get the recording, we will be posting it on our website if you wanted to go back and listen to it. We're also working on a summary report of the focus groups that we conducted in the spring, and that is near completion. So once it is finalized, we'll be posting it on our website if you're interested in any of the information or data that we're sharing today. So um, please check back for that. You can also email me and I can share that when it is finalized. And my email will be at the end of this presentation. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the first webinar, which was held two weeks ago, we do have the full recording on the website as well. If you go to our site, cyanonline.org, there's a link on the homepage that will take you directly to the recording. And then um, just a note that we do have everybody on mute today, but if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and I can answer them when they pop up or also answer them at the end of the webinar today. So again, many thanks for taking the time to join us this morning and we're excited to share some of the things that we have found with the focus groups and the conversations that we've been having with young people over the past many years. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the work that we do here at the California Youth Advocacy Network, we are a statewide training and technical assistance agency that is funded through the California Department of Public Health Tobacco Control Program. So our team works with CTCP funded agencies to provide you all with support and engaging youth and young adults in your local and regional advocacy work. So we, um, we can provide you with training and support on how to actually engage young people and then also work directly with your youth and young adult partners to equip them in doing policy work and advocacy campaigns in their local communities or on their college and universities campuses. Um, we've also been working with military communities for over 15 years and while we're not actively working with the population, we still do provide some support to our partners who work with military communities or with veterans um, on tobacco prevention and treatment here in California. And then because of these populations that we serve, we have been doing a lot of work around new and emerging products and uh, youth and young adult use of those products. And um, this really came up many years back when we started to see just a rise in the products in California and of course, just what we know historically from tobacco use, youth and young adults are the people who generally start to experiment with these products, they initiate use and then become addicted to the products. So we really look at what the products are and how they're being used and then youth and young adult knowledge of these products. And that's a lot of the information that Caitlin shared two weeks ago on the webinar was looking at the research and looking at the data of what populations are using what products and just the rates of use. And then, as I mentioned today, I'm really going to dive into the conversations that we've been having with young people um, and all of these conversations that we have lead our team to develop resources and materials for youth and young adults and then also tools and resource, resources for all of you in the field to support the work that you're doing. So today what we're going to do is we're going to um, just quickly take a look at some of the information that Caitlin shared a couple of weeks ago and then dive into the focus groups that we've conducted and provide you some context with how we conduct the focus groups and then what we've been learning through these conversations. So as was mentioned um, by Caitlin a couple weeks back, 
We have seen since 2017 a pretty significant increase in vaping among young people. So it's a 135% increase in teen vaping. And this is troubling for many reasons, but especially when we look at the fact that we peaked with our height of vaping in 2015 and started to see a decrease between 2015 and 2017 in how many young people were were starting to vape. So we were starting to really celebrate our success in tobacco control, seeing a decline in use of all of the different products. And then um, that all changed. And, and as was previously mentioned, and I think this is, um, if you are watching the news, we can really attribute this to Juul and also just the the introduction of these new pod based products that are higher in nicotine and then they also have nicotine salt solutions which are easier for young people to consume and consume more of which is resulting in greater addiction um, and we know looking at both california and national data that youth are using e-cigarette products at significantly higher rates than other tobacco products but of all the products that are used, young people are using flavored tobacco. And so when we look at if they're smoking cigarettes or using hookah, little cigar, cigarillos, uh, all of those products, including the e-cigarette devices, are all flavored. And we know that flavors are responsible also for youth initiation. So the majority of young people who ever start to use a tobacco product start using a flavored product. So um, a lot of you are working on local flavored ordinances and that work is really, really important. Um, we know that there's also recently been a lot of, not recently, actually this has um, been a long-term pushback on the inclusion of mentholated products or mint products in flavored work. And um, one thing to just keep in mind and to know that when we look at recent national data on what types of flavored products young people are using, What's really interesting is we've seen a decline in some of the flavors that youth are using, such as candy flavors or fruit flavors, and we're seeing an increase in the use of mentholated or mint flavors. And some of this definitely could be attributed to um, changes by companies is no longer selling their mango flavors or cucumber flavors, but they continue to sell their mentholated flavors. So um, it's anticipated that this change is going to continue, that the use of some of the other flavors will go down, but youth will continue to be using mint and mentholated products, especially if they remain available for young people. And then we know that young people are also using little cigars and cigarillos. It's the second most used tobacco product by teens in California. And we're gonna get into some of the findings that we um, we learned about Little Cigars some really interesting things. And of course, these products, just like the vaping devices, are also flavored products. When we look at young adults, um, young adults are often, because they're part of the general adult population, we look at young adults as 18 to 29 year olds and compare data from that age group population to other adults. And what we find is among the adult population as a whole, young adults have significantly higher rates of use, especially when it comes to vaping. So this is really important also when we talk about a lot of the work, again, that you all are doing at the local level. We hear from vaping advocates that it's something that helps people quit. We also hear them say that they need flavors to quit. But when we look at actually who is using these devices, it's young adults who are using the products. And it's um, also young adults, as we're gonna point out in a minute, who are in college, which is, different from what we've seen in the past with cigarette smoking. And then of course we know that young adults are using flavored products similar to youth and our young adult populations in California have the highest rate of hookah use of any population with teens, with older adults. Um, young adults are the ones that are smoking hookah and this is not surprising when you look at other research that shows that a large number of hookah shops and tobacco shops in California are actually located within a mile of a college and university campus. So the amount of exposure that young adults are getting to these products, not only just exposure of use, but the advertising and marketing and access um, is significant and has an impact on their use. And then when we look at 
Marijuana. Um, we also know that marijuana use is high and it's actually higher than use of any other tobacco products in California. And so um, when we look at just some of the data on e-cigarettes, we see that marijuana use, and this is both combustible marijuana use as well as vaporized marijuana. And also edibles would be part of this, but we know that youth aren't consuming as many edibles as they are just smoking marijuana or vaping marijuana. But marijuana use among youth is high, as is use among young adults. So you can see we actually saw an increase, and it's a pretty significant increase in young adults who reported marijuana use in 2018. This data, it's also really important to note that this data is looking at past 30-day use. So these are young people who are using these products on a regular basis. This is not any use. When we look at any use, that number goes up um, pretty significantly. We've seen some data specifically for college students who use marijuana at the national level, and it's near 50% of young adults have reported any use of marijuana. And then, as I've mentioned, we also know that college students have higher rates of both vaping nicotine and marijuana than young adults who are not in college. And so this is really um, interesting, especially as we know many of our campuses in the state are going smoke and tobacco free, but colleges similar to high school campuses are experiencing challenge with compliance, with policy compliance of young people being able to vape or use products on their campuses that are much more discreet than in the past. And so um, we're looking at what are some different strategies that can be utilized to help decrease the use of all of these products. We also know that age is critical in the work that we do. And so historically, youth have always been the ones, we know that they have historically been the targets of tobacco companies and the marketing. After the mass settlement agreement was signed in 1998, that did shift in the sense that companies could no longer legally target teens. And so instead, they started to focus their work on young adults. Um, at that time, we saw a lot of changes with how they were marketing. We see them in bars and nightclubs and giving out different um, promotions, mailers, couponings. Um, we still are seeing this. We're having a problem right now. There's a company who, in Cal they're a national company, but in California, they're giving out um, free vending machines to colleges and universities, to fraternities and sororities and to bars and nightclubs, and the vending machines distribute jewels. And so this is really important because we know that, that young adulthood is a time when that addiction really sets in. And so young people experiment with the products, teens are experimenting these, with these products, and then really what research has shown is that the addiction is setting in during the young adult years, so between 20 and 22. So those are really critical years. Now, is this changing with these new vaping devices? It's possible that it is. Um, as we're going to be sharing in our focus groups, we are hearing young people who are self-identifying as being addicted. So um, when now is addiction setting in with these new products? That's going to be really important research to look at once we have it. Um, and then we also know when we look at vaping and we look at um, tobacco use overall, we do know that older teens and younger young adults are the ones that are initiating these products. When we look at middle school rates compared to high school rates, we're definitely seeing the older teens, juniors and seniors are the ones who are um, using these products. But with that said, we are also seeing young people at the middle school level who are starting this. Um, this definitely has an impact on schools and the need to be implementing curriculum at younger age. But it's also important to continue that messaging and to continue that work um, beyond middle school years and moving it into high school since that junior and senior year is definitely a time and it's a challenge. And then also one thing that is so critical to note with young adults is that while that age group is important in terms of when they really start establishing that pattern of addiction, we also know that when young adults make quit attempts, they are have the highest rate of success in quitting. And so it's really an important age group to be working with to encourage quit attempts and supporting them in quitting when they're ready to quit. 
And we just had a question come in asking about the Juul vending machines and whether or not it's illegal in California. And that's a great question. I just want to take a side note to share that really fast. So what we were hearing, we were hearing from some of our partners in LA County that they, the city attorney was contacted by a company that is offering, again, offering these, essentially it's a scholarship to pay for vending machine placement in Greek housing and also in um, any bars or adult only facilities. So within California, a vending machine can only be located in an adult only facility. And so technically a bar, if they card and it's over 21, they could be placed in that location unless there are local ordinances that say that there can be no self-serving or no vending machine. So LA, for example, has some of those stronger ordinances so it would cover there. Um, with the Greek housing, those are definitely, it gets a little bit tricky because they're private housing. So it they should fall under our state law because they are not technically adult only because we have a tobacco 21 law and there are people under 21 who live in Greek housing. So technically it should be covering Greek housing, but not bars in every community. So it's tricky. Um, and all of this is just to say that with all of these new products, we have new challenges and new things to just be looking at as we're constantly looking at how to make sure that our ordinances and policies um, are comprehensive enough to cover all of the, the new and emerging products that we're seeing. We also wanna note that the type of products matter. And so we know that young people are initiating their tobacco use with non-cigarette products, but we also have research that shows that young people who are vaping or using these other products are at significantly higher risk of switching to cigarettes or using both products. And so we have to really look at the products that though that they're starting with and then um, trying to figure out, especially now as we're doing all this great work with banning flavors and trying to limit exposure to these different products, how do we support them in quitting so that they don't switch over to combustible cigarettes? And then it's also important to know, and this is really what we're gonna be sharing today with our focus groups, that not all young people are using the same types of products. And so when we are doing our prevention campaigns out there, it's so critical to understand the young people in your community understand the products that they're using and they're being exposed to so that we can really target our messaging and our interventions to those products versus trying to treat all, yes, all young people as one large population that are using the same devices. So now let's get into our focus groups and our findings from those groups. So as I mentioned, um, our team has been doing focus groups for quite a number of years. We started these groups initially because we started to see an increase in these new products that were hitting the market. And so um, when we started these, it was really, we were seeing college students who were using a lot of hookah products. And then we saw that um, the use of some of the newer vaping devices, which are now not so new anymore. Um, we were seeing second generation vaping devices, which are the vape pens. And so we thought, you know, we need to really understand what is the information that young people have on these products and what do they think about the products? And then we also needed to know what were young people calling these products because what we found through our groups was that most often young people were using different terminology of the products than we were using to do education and prevention. And so we thought, let's sit down with youth and young adults and talk about these products and talk about what they know and what they're hearing and what they call these products. And so we started these groups in 2013. We generally do the groups in the spring, so towards the end of the year. And since we started the groups, we have done six waves. We're actually currently doing a round of focus groups right now. And um, this was kind of an, a not planned wave of groups, but we're doing some, some testing of knowledge and um, how young people receive information, which I'm gonna share about in a bit. And so I'm gonna focus today on what we found in the spring of 2019, but we'll also be talking about some of the pretty significant changes that we've been documenting throughout all of our years of doing focus groups. And so with these groups, 
what we try to do is we do youth specific groups and we do young adult specific groups. Now, of course, there are times when we do mixed groups. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, we worked with an agency that works with transitional age youth. They're called TAYS. And so these young adults are young adults who um, were previously incarcerated in the foster care system or homeless. And this organization was serving those young adults. Some of them were still minors. We would see some that were maybe 16, 17, and then all the way up to the age of 24. And so in those cases, when we have opportunities to partner with organizations who are serving um, TAYS or transitional age youth, uh, we do see a mix of age group populations. But otherwise, we do try to separate them out simply because we don't want some of the older students to influence younger students. We definitely see that younger students don't feel as comfortable sharing and talking when there's much older students in the room. So with this year, the focus groups that we did, we did mostly youth focus groups, so middle school and high school age youth. We did one young adult group and then we did a mixed group. And the way that we find our um, youth partners and young adult partners to interview is we really work with all of you at the local level. And we work with partners from TUPI, and then we also work with our partners from colleges and universities. And just really try to identify where are their um, youth in the community, specifically are there areas that are seeing higher rates of use or where there's some more problems with tobacco that we can just partner with young people and just have these conversations. Every year that we do these groups, we change the devices that we talk about. So we really try to focus on the devices that we're either seeing in research, uh, there's an increase in use, or we're just hearing anecdotally from our youth and young adult partners about use. And those are the devices that we focus on or the products that we focus on. So over the years, we've really covered all of the products. We've looked at all of the different generations of vaping devices. We've looked at smokeless tobacco use and hookah use. And this year, we wanted to really focus in on um, vaping. We also were working with CTCP since um, some of the heat not burn products are being introduced into the US market. We wanted to just test out to see if young people are aware of what those products are. Um, of course, we wanted to talk about little cigars and cigarillos, again, seeing that that's the second most used product among California teens. And then, of course, as I'll say in a bit too, this is important to note that whenever we have these conversations, we always end up talking about marijuana. So we've intentionally put in questions this time around that focused on the use of marijuana. And um, then what we do is once we really partner with our community partners, uh, we create flyers and different things and we then um, do some recruitment to bring in youth. We are usually looking for general population are not looking for young people to be involved who are involved in tobacco control because we really want to hear from youth who haven't been trained and haven't been uh, directly educated on tobacco and tobacco control and just get their thoughts and, and what they're seeing on campus and also their perceptions. And when we do recruitment, um, usually focus groups are 45 to 60 minutes long and we do provide snacks and food and then we also give gift cards to thank them for their involvement in the focus groups. So we have a pretty extensive interview guide that we use to conduct these focus groups. Um, we break it up into sections based on uh, the content that we're hoping to get. So the first thing we do is we, sh we actually show pictures of the various products that we're testing. And we are doing that so that we can learn terminology. Um, we do not put up the names of any of the products. We simply show pictures and we asking people to tell us what the products are. Then we ask them to share what they know about the products. And that's where we really learn if they have correct knowledge or they have misinformation on the products. And we use that information for our myth and reality resources. We then ask them about who uses them. So we never ask young people to self-disclose if they are tobacco users. If they want to share that with us, um, they definitely can, and we let them know that it's a safe space to do so. But we never directly ask them, do you use these products um, verbally? We do ask them on a demographic document, but we don't ask them face-to-face. Uh, -face. But we do say, you know, who do you know that uses these products? Can you tell us about them? Are they your same age? 
Um, do they go to school here? So we ask really for demographic information too of who's using these different products. We always ask if they use flavors, um, especially just to really support the work that's happening at the local level to show the impact of flavor tobacco products on young people. And then we ask them where they're using them. This was a question that we just added this year because of the high rates of use and the reporting that we're getting from schools about use within the schools. We then also ask about messages. So we want to test what messages will prevent initiation and what messages might motivate quit attempts. Um, the messaging, we've always tested different messages, but this year we added in questions specifically to tobacco treatment and what would potentially motivate you to consider quitting. And so we test things like health consequences, we test things about industry targeting or cost, we look at addiction, and then we also look at social justice issues. So things like the environmental impact of these different products. We then look at um, cessation. So we want to know if young people that are using these products, if they are motivated to quit and if we could get them to be motivated, what would that be? How could we get them to be motivated? And then we also ask them um, who trusted adults are. So this is something that came out at the first focus group we had in spring. We were talking about quitting and who would potentially help them quit. And the conversation naturally went to, you know, we always hear about peers, but it went to adults and trusted adults. So we started to ask who are those trusted adults? And then we really wanted to find out what resources they would use. So if we could give them any of these resources, the helpline or apps or chats, what could we give them to help them with their quitting? And then um, information. So we wanted to know how they get information. Who are they getting the information from? Uh, what websites? What, what resources? And then we also wanted to know what they trust. So what information do they trust? There's a lot of misinformation out there. So how can we help them know that the information we're providing is trusted information? And then we also wanted to know if they're getting prevention resources and where those prevention resources are. And then finally, we do test for materials. So we want to find out from them, um, are they looking at only digital messages? Are they looking at print materials? If they're looking at print materials, what kind of print materials? What are the sizes? What kind of colors do they like? What kind of language are they using? If it's too wordy, do they like humor, um, shock messages? What are the different things that they will pay attention to? At the end of each focus group, we give them demographic forms. Um, on the front side of the form, we have them share their age, their um, gender. We also talk specifically about their tobacco use, their use of e-cigarettes. We want to know what products they have used, if they have vaped, and then also marijuana use. This is something that we've pulled out this year, where in the past we just had to use tobacco and then the vaping, and we added specifically marijuana. Um, we did not note, though, on marijuana how marijuana was used, so we didn't specifically say, do you vape it or eat it or smoke it? That's something that we're looking at doing in the future, and then also race and ethnicity. Um, we also are excited to be working with the LGBTQ Statewide Coordinating Center in the future so that we can put sexual orientation and gender identity questions on our demographic form. And then on the back with the tobacco products, we, in every focus group we have, we hear from young people that tobacco products, um, specifically cigarettes, are horrible. So we've never met a young person that says that smoking cigarettes is not bad. And so we like to just compare and say, okay, we know that the worst tobacco product there is, is a cigarette. Tell us then if we compare a cigarette to vaping or to cigars, or marijuana. Tell us if you think it's safer, about the same, or if it's more harmful than these other products. And then, of course, we ask them if they have any follow-up questions. Is that also lets us know, is there any missing information that we need to be getting out to young people? So, along the way with the demographic forms, we've used the same model of interviewing since 2013, but along the way, what we change is every time we change the products, just depending again on what we're seeing, 
we have added marijuana. We added that probably about four years ago because the conversation was always coming back to marijuana. And then this year we added questions about, we added some new questions about the messaging, the treatment. And then we also started to get into what the consequences of using products on high school campuses were. So we wanted to know from young people, if somebody gets caught vaping, what happens? Do they get suspended? Do they go to the office? And then what happens with that and how effective do you think that is? And actually what we found was that the, the consequences of use for a lot of young people, um, the suspension and having to write essays, that to them that wasn't really much of a consequence, but having to speak to a trusted adult was. And so um, I'm gonna talk about that later. And a lot of our conversations about the consequences really led into conversations about treatment and the need to be supporting young people in quitting these products. We also on the demographic forum did add those questions about marijuana use. And then this year added the questions about the danger of the different products. And then, as I mentioned, we are currently undergoing some more focus groups with youth specifically, and we'll be starting with young adults in January about information processing. And so we're wanting to find out from young people if they truly understand what addiction is. And um, also we're testing their pre and post knowledge. So we really want to know, again, what is their knowledge right now on all of these products, specifically on vaping and marijuana use, because we're finding a lot of misinformation out there. So what is their knowledge? And then we're testing educational materials to see if what they're learning after that. And then we're doing some pretty extensive testing to make sure that based on our educational materials, that they're recalling the correct information. And we want to make sure that they're um, learning what we want them to be learning on the materials. So in the spring, we did seven groups. Um, of that, we had 63 participants. And we worked with different groups within Fresno, Mariposa, Nevada, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. And just um, a big thank you to all of our partners in those counties for welcoming us in your counties and um, working with us to conduct these focus groups. And then, as I mentioned, we've really focused the spring focus groups on product identification and knowledge as well as uh, the treatment conversation and information processing. So what was interesting with our spring groups, uh, it was a really great and diverse group of young people. We had almost half of the group was Hispanic Latino and then um, almost a quarter was African American. So we had a really great diverse group of young people that we were working with. And then also looking at age, we had a mixture of higher numbers of middle school students and um, older high school students, which again, from looking at the data, we know that those 16 and 17 year olds are the ones that are starting to use these products at higher rates. So we were excited to be able to have these conversations with these young people. And we didn't do too many college groups this year. And so that's something that we're gonna be focusing on in the spring. And then looking at use, um, you can see from this chart that it was it was interesting because I think we often hear that all young people are using these products and we actually see that a lot too with youth and young adults who think that all of their peers are using. And so when we looked at who was actually using, um, about 12% of teens reported vaping. What was interesting is that we actually had a higher amount of um, young people who were smoking tobacco, but I think based on what we learned from them, because we didn't pull out, when we said tobacco, we didn't pull out little cigars and cigarillos. And so um, looking at what they were reporting and what they were sharing in the focus group, our assumption is that the products being used were some of those flavored products. And then also um, looking at their any use. So there was a good, portion of young people who had reported vaping or marijuana use, they just hadn't used it within the past 30 days. So the first set of products that we showed people, the young people were these first generation or the cigalike products. And so when we asked them what they called them, they said, oh, that's an e-cig, e-cigarette or a vape. Um, they also some of the young people called it a cancer stick. So this is pretty consistent with what we have found in the past. Um, everything that they shared, yep, these are what old people use, my grandparents use them, parents, cousins, and that these products um, are associated with 
quitting smoking, which again, if you look at who is using the products, many of these older people identify, yep, I switched to this product. I've been a 40 year smoker, so I switched to it so that I can get help quitting. And this is, again, pretty consistent with what we've seen in the past. And that's what young people were thinking about these products. Um, we have always been told by young people that when you say e-cigarette, because cigarette is in the name, they associate that with a combustible cigarette. Therefore, it's not a good product. It's not a healthy product. And that was also, if we compared this product to other vaping devices, this one would be the unhealthy one, whereas some of the other vaping devices would not be so. We then looked at the, the vape pens. And um, what was fascinating about this product was that the majority of young people referred to this as a wax pen or a weed pen. And in the past, when these devices were first introduced, we heard a lot about this being a hookah pen or a vape pen. But it wasn't really until this year that we started to hear young people call this a wax pen. And when we asked them about the use of this product, they said this was by far the most popular product um, that they had, that they were seeing on campus. And so we did ask them, you know, when you know people that are using this product, are you they using this to vape nicotine solutions or to vape marijuana or THC solutions? And the majority of young people said people were using it to vape marijuana. So they were using it as a wax pen. Um, it was really easy to get a hold of the cartridges. You could just go buy a cartridge and screw it in. And, um, you know, you could get the cheap ones at this store if you wanted to get the more expensive one from the dispensary that was licensed, you could do that. But so they, they were very familiar with the products. They were very familiar with where you could get them. Um, and like I said, what was so different from the past was that they noted that this product was specifically used for marijuana and not for nicotine solutions. Um, they also told us that the people who use these devices were using them also because of the flavor and that they saw these all over the place. So they saw them being used in classrooms and in schools and that these products were really associated with getting high, of course, because they're marijuana devices, but also to help with stress and to help with sleep. We talked about these mods and tanks. Um, the terminology that told us that they were the refillable ones, they were vapes, box mods, and then cloud nine. Uh, these were all associated with doing tricks. So we see this a lot within young adult populations of doing cloud chasing and doing tricks. There are vape shops that sponsor cloud chasing competitions, give out scholarships to students. Um, so that is exactly how these young people associated these products. They also associated use of these products with um, really all ages, but they said, you know, when we, when we think about the typical user, it's really young adults. But they all knew about them. They just were saying, when we were talking to the high school students, they were just saying they don't see a lot of these products among their peers, but they know young adults or college students who are using them and that these are really used for fun and they're used for blowing smoke rings and for these different tricks. And the fun flavors or the really like fruity flavors like Fruit Loops or Hawaiian Punch were the different products that were used for these devices. Um, something else that was interesting was they had talked about how these products had a much harsher hit on the throat and so they were harder to use. And that's actually something that is a huge difference between some of the older generation products and these newer generations or the pod vice is that these older mods and tanks are using a free base nicotine solution, which is much of a harder hit on the throat. And um, you can't get in as much of the the aerosol because of that, whereas the pod based products have a nicotine salt, so they're easier for the user to inhale. And so that's pretty consistent again with that information. And young people said, yeah, you can use these with THC solutions, but not as much as people are just using them with the um, different uh, nicotine. So then we got to Juul. We specifically wanted to talk about Juul because we wanted to know, looking at the demographic of young people that we were meeting with, if they were using Juul and what they were seeing. And so 
the youth that we had talked to said, yeah, we all know what Jewel is. They could call Jewel out by their name. They all just said Jewel. And um, this was, you know, they recognize it's vaping, but it's used by its name, Jewel. And so they all knew about it. But when we talked about their own use, we talked about, you know, we asked, do you have friends that use these products? Do you see these products on campus? Um, who do you know that use these products? It was really interesting because most of them said, yeah, we actually don't see Juul specifically on our campuses. And we asked them why that was, and it was mixed. So some said, you know, we're not seeing it because everybody knows what it is. Our parents know what it is. Teachers know what it is. They're looking for this product specifically. And so people don't use it anymore because of that. And then we also heard young people say, oh yeah, only the white kids use this or only the kids who are like trying to be preppy and popular are using this. So it was definitely associated with a, a certain demographic of teens who were using these products. Um, we did ask them, you know, think about the young people you know that are using them and why they're using them. And people said, oh yeah, it's definitely because of the flavors. It's really easy to use and it's really easy to share. So we heard a lot of kids talk about Puff Puff Pass where you're walking in a hall, you can take a couple hits off of a device and then you can hand it and no one would be able to see because they're so small and you can hide them in your hand. Young people did associate this specific product with addiction. So when we asked them to think about, you know, the people that you're using, do they use this all the time? Do they use it socially? And so they were saying the people that they know or who have seen who have used this product specifically, when they use it, they use it a lot. So really connecting it with that level of addiction. We also hear a lot about Soren. Um, we have some partners in Madera County who had shared with us that they're actually, uh, law enforcement is finding a problem with middle schoolers. There's um, sales of these products on middle school campuses, specifically of Soren. So we wanted to know, are you seeing Soren? Are students switching from Juul to Soren? And that's what we found was that, first of all, Soren has a bunch of different models. And so it's really hard to track some of these newer devices that don't look like Juul because it's hard to see that this is a vaping device. So as a teacher or a counselor or a parent might not know that this is actually a vaping device because it doesn't look like a Juul, whereas some of the other devices, many of the other devices look like a Juul. So this, they said, yeah, we know what it is. Some of them actually didn't know what it was. They had to kind of squint at the screen and read what it was. Um, but the ones that did know what it is said, yeah, people are using this one because it's easier to hide. Um, they also know that it's, it's a smoother hit. Again, it's a nicotine-based product and that um, it's really, really strong. And so we know that Sorens also have really high levels of nicotine in them, which is why some young people said, yeah, when, when this is used, you get kind of, you get sick and you get headaches. And that is definitely, again, because of those higher levels of nicotine. Um, those are things that we had to call out after they share that. We definitely use these focus groups as an opportunity to educate as well. And so we share with young people, hey, you know, those headaches are associated with nicotine. So we can educate them on that as well. Um, something else that was really interesting is that cost had a big influence on the young people that we were talking to. And so they said that this product specifically is pretty expensive. And so not a lot of people are getting it because of the cost of it, unless they can get it for cheap or get it in bulk, like I said, if somebody is selling it on a campus. Um, we did ask about people selling the products on their campuses and we didn't find high schools where that was happening, but we did have students tell us, oh yeah, we hear about high school students going to middle schools and selling products on campus. We also asked about some of the other products that we are hearing from partners in other states or um, that we are starting to just see introduced into the market. So one product that we've heard is kind of popping up on the East Coast and the Midwest is a product called JC01. And JC01 is a a smaller device that is designed to be paired with an assortment of different types of pods. So you could pair it with a Jewel pod or a Pax pod or any of these various pods. And we did not find one young person who knew what that was. They all thought that it was just a typical box mod. We also asked about some of the newer disposable pods. So um, this was back in the spring before puff bars. And so we were asking about um, this 
specific device. This is a, a pod based product that you use. And once the solution runs out, you just throw away the whole device and then you get a new one. Um, nobody said that they saw these products or were using any of these products. Again, we're starting to see changes with that now, but I'll talk about that in just a second. And then the IQOS is the heat not burn product from Philip Morris. And when we showed this device, none of them knew what it was. They had a lot of questions. They were really intrigued by what it was, but they didn't know anybody who had used it. They hadn't heard of it. And um, they we tested actually three different heat not burn products and none of them knew anything about the product. So that was good to hear. And then just overall, what we had found with vaping as a whole, that we found that again, e-cigarettes, when you say e-cigarettes, that that is associated with harm because of the word cigarette and the product. But e-cigarettes really just pertain to that first generation of the cigalike products. The rest of the, the vaping devices weren't really classified as an e-cigarette. They were vaping. And that we had mixed results on vaping of nicotine. Um, some people felt like it was less harmful. Some people felt like it was about the same as using cigarettes. But again, it was really specific to the type of product. And then everybody recognized Jules and everybody recognized the vape pen, but it was really different on who used the product. So again, um, the Juul use was really associated with the white kids and the white students, whereas vape pens and marijuana use was associated with everybody and with all age group. And there was just a belief that everybody was using these different vaping devices, the vape pen, the wax pen specifically. Um, and then we also heard from young people who just talked about the frequency of use. And that was really troubling when we asked them, are students just using these once a day? Do you see it once a day? Or is it happening throughout the day? And they would say, you know, people are using them all the time. They're using them before school, after school, during school. They use them three to four times a day. We have friends who are vaping them every 20 minutes. Um, again, perception versus reality is always different, but to see that the people that they know who are using them, the frequency of use is really problematic when we're talking about addiction um, and supporting the treatment of these different products. So that's definitely something to know. We also wanted to talk about cigars. So we went into cigars and um, we talked about these large cigars and youth told us, no, we don't know anyone who uses them. The people who do are like the old white guys and military, which is consistent with also the research to show that that is who is in fact using them. Um, they also said these were bad products. They're not good for you. They're dangerous. And they even told us, yeah, these are more dangerous than cigarettes. The change though, when we started to talk about little cigars and cigarillos. So this is one of the images we showed them, but we did show them an assortment of different brands of these products. And all of the young people said that they knew what they were. Um, they did not use terminology that we use, which is little cigars and cigarillos. They called them by their brand name. So when they talked about Swishers, um, if they did not talk about them by brand name, they talked about them as blunts or blunt wrappers or wraps. And that was really associated with how the products were used. So uh, we did not find a lot of young people who just reported use of these products alone. Generally, these products were used in combination with marijuana. And what was fascinating is young people sat there and told us about how it's done. So they said, you know, you just easily you cut it open, you dump out the tobacco, you put in the weed, and then you lick it and you seal it back up. Um, they talked about how they have friends who you can tell who are the ones that smoke blunts because their lips are discolored from licking the cigar wrapper and putting it back together. And then they talked about, you know, if you don't have a lot of weed, you just take out some of the tobacco and then you put the weed back in. We asked them why people were using these products to smoke marijuana and they said because they're all flavored, uh, because it's a controlled burn. So it burns better and slower than if you use paper. They're affordable and they're really accessible. Um, we did ask some of the young people who had a lot of knowledge of these products if they would ever use something else to smoke weed. And they looked at us really confused, like, well, what else would you use to smoke weed? <laughs> these are the only things that we use to smoke weed. So that was really interesting to hear that conversation, um, that these are, are really 
um, big when used for smoking marijuana and trying to do that education around blunts are both tobacco and marijuana. A lot of the young people, once we entered in marijuana, that changed what they thought about the health of the products. Um, some of the popular brands that we heard were Backwoods, Dutch, the Swisher Sweets, and then Black and Milds. Um, with marijuana, we did ask specifically about what terminology. We know we're always here at CYN questioning, do we say cannabis or marijuana? And what we found is when we said the word cannabis, they said, yeah, cannabis, that's like the scientific term. Um, it also, when they think about cannabis, it's more medicinal. And so we actually try to avoid using the word cannabis because it's not the language that youth are using. And so we asked, what words do you use? And they said, yeah, weed and pot. Um, sometimes marijuana, but it's really weed and pot. They talked again a lot about wax pens and how wax pens are used for vaping marijuana. Um, but every form of marijuana use, whether it be vaped or even combustible, was perceived as being safer than cigarettes. And it wasn't just like, I think it might be safer than cigarettes. It was, yeah, they're safer. These are safe products. And a lot of people had misinformation about these products being a cure for cancer. Um, they just, there was not really a lot of harm associated with this product. We asked them about why that was, and you know, we heard a lot about it's organic, it's natural, there's no industry around it. So a lot of the things that we do in tobacco control to try to vilify the industry or try to just get young people thinking about how bad, not just the product, that commercial tobacco is bad, but overall the industry is, was not associated with marijuana. So there's definitely a need to do a lot of education there. One thing that was interesting though, is when we asked about who was using these products and the frequency of use, a lot of young people noticed, noted that, that their peers are using these products daily, that it's not being used socially. And they did say, yeah, I have friends who are addicted to these products. So they were associating some level of addiction to marijuana. However, that association of addiction did differ in the sense that, you know, addiction to tobacco and vaping seemed a lot worse than addiction to marijuana. So we really dug into what would motivate a quit attempt. And um, this really varies, again, it very much varies by population. And so we asked specifically about cost. And in some populations, they said, yeah, cost is definitely something that would motivate a quit attempt because this, especially vaping, vaping can be really expensive to have to buy these different products and all of the pods. And some of the devices are really expensive. So that was an issue with some populations. Um, purpose was huge. So young people who were connected into a sports team or connected into a club or had the intention of going into the military or going into college, they said that if tobacco or marijuana use impacted this outcome that they had, that that had a huge influence. And then of course their peers. And so we were told time and time again that if they had friends that were quitting or if their social environment was changing and people weren't using these products that they would much be much more apt to quitting. But unfortunately what we had heard from many was, but everyone's using them. So we would never even do that, um, which is unfortunate because again, the reality of it is while we have higher rates, not everyone is using them. It's actually, you know, in nationally, um, it's about one in four teens are vaping, but in California, it's much lower than that. And so the social norming really needs to focus on most young people aren't using these products. We talked about messaging and um, again, that social norming of just letting young people know that not everybody is doing this, even though they think that everyone is doing it. Definitely think that most of their peers are vaping, but when we talked about marijuana, they said, yeah, everyone I know is smoking marijuana, which again, isn't true when we actually looked at the number of people from our focus groups that were vaping and using marijuana. So I think that norming is really critical. Um, we talked about industry targeting and priority populations. We talked about overall industry targeting and industry targeting of youth didn't resonate. But when we talked about, you know, let's talk about how the industry targets African-American communities, that really got students thinking and got them really angry that um, the industry was coming after their community. And so that's a really important message with diverse young people. And then understanding addiction. So 
not just the idea of addiction, because we were told by many young people, yeah, we know about addiction and these products, but when we started to decompose addiction, that was what really got to them. So when we said, you know, think about sitting in class and uh, you just feel like you have to get up and go vape, that's what addiction looks like. It, it was interesting to see how their faces changed when they started to think about that and think like, oh no, I might be addicted to these products. And then we asked them what would what would help them quit or who would help them quit? And so when we talked about caring adults, they said a parent could, um, a counselor, a coach, or a doctor. And so making sure to equip these individuals to be able to support quit attempts. And then also we heard, um, we did some focus groups at youth drop-in centers, and we were told that if the people at the drop-in centers were equipped to give out resources and do brief interventions, that would really support them in quitting because for them, those, those individuals at the youth drop-in centers were their trusted and caring adults. And then we got mixed reviews on the free apps and whether or not they would be using those apps. Um, we did in this, we just started this fall, we just started to do a new round of focus groups. And while we aren't gonna share all of our findings, I did just wanna note some of the things that we had talked about in our spring groups and what we're finding in these groups are really interesting. So. Um, the groups that we're doing right now are different because we're doing more of a discussion on treatment and also on information processing. And so what we've done is we're working right now mostly in Sacramento County and um, we've been at a few different sites. One of the sites is a predominantly white school. And what's been fascinating about these conversations are the problems are really different than what we saw in our focus groups in the spring with a much more diverse group of young people. Um, so looking at the rates again, it was interesting to see and also not so surprising to see that the, the tobacco use rates were lower. Again, um, especially when we're talking about white teens, their demographic is not generally using the flavored cigarillos. Um, but we saw the rates of vaping and then the marijuana use is also um, consistently high, but the use of the current vaping is definitely um, what is problematic. And then when we looked at what they were telling us about use, so at this predominantly white high school, we were told, yeah, people are still drooling. So in one, Sense. You know, we did these spring focus groups with a really diverse group of youth and we were told, nope, there's not a lot of people who are using Juul, but white kids are using Juul. And now we're doing focus groups at a predominantly white high school and finding, yeah, a lot of these kids are still using Juul. Um, and then we're also hearing about Sorens and then pens and wax pens. Uh, however, the use of wax pens was not as prevalent, at least what they're telling us, it was really the nicotine salt products or the pod mods that they're using. And then we also were told about puff bars, which we've been seeing some conversations on partners about this on InfoHub. I know that some of our Northern counties have been seeing the use of these products and they're popping up here in Sacramento products. And again, that's a disposable device that young people get a hold of and then you can uh, get rid of it once you're out of the solution. And we asked them, where are you guys seeing these? And they're saying all over, at school, at home, during class, after school, before school. So they're really being used all over the place. So we tested out all of the same messages that we did with our spring focus groups. And the only two messages that really resonated with young people were the addiction and then the recent vaping illnesses and deaths. So with the addiction, again, um, very fascinating and similar, almost identical results to our spring groups where we ask them about addiction and they say, yeah, we know these products are addicting. But when we ask them what that actually means and we started to share symptoms, they did not know what addiction was. So um, breaking down what addiction actually looks like to get you thinking about it and processing. And then we talked about the vaping related illnesses and they said that the pictures were really scary and knowing that that could happen was really troubling. Um, but unfortunately they did associate it with use of illicit THC pens. 
So when we talked to them about like, how does this impact the use of Juul or Soren? And they said, oh, that lung disease doesn't apply to those products. So that was also troubling um, because that again, kind of differentiates. We asked them specifically about quitting. So what was interesting, the spring groups that we did, they listed out parents as a population of adults that they would get support from in quitting. But with the teens that we've been talking to, um, these young people have said, mm -mm, I'm not going to get help if in any way my parents find out about me vaping. And so they said, we are, we're testing a new quit brochure for teens right now. And we were told over and over again, it needs to say anonymous. We need to know that my parents are not going to get called. If I call somebody for support, it's not going to be reported to my parents. And so they were really specific and kept saying over and over and over again, I don't want my parents to know that I'm getting help quitting. But many of them said like, yeah, I would get help quitting. So we asked them, who would you get help quitting from? And they said, our counselors, a trusted teacher or a coach. So theirs was very school centric. And um, they said, you know, if I went into a counselor and they gave me a free resource that told me how to quit, I, yeah, I would maybe call a helpline or use an app as long as I was not reported to my parents. What was interesting after one of our focus group, we had students that came up to us and said, there is nothing you can say or do that would stop us from vaping. And so we started to ask some of the things like beyond the education and the prevention messaging. And we asked like, you know, what if you didn't have access to these products? Would you guys still use them? And talked about flavored ordinances. We talked about different disciplines in school and they said, no, discipline's a joke. What you write an essay, if you get in trouble or you get sent home from school for a day or two, like those things don't matter that much. The one thing they said, which I thought was so fascinating was, I had to go and talk to a counselor and the counselor started asking me about my use. That is horrifying. So basically equipping counselors to do motivational interviewing, to ask them, you know, why are you using and how did you start using and how do you feel about your use and going through that with them and making them thinking, think about their vaping. That to them was like the worst thing ever because they didn't want to have to face that. They didn't want to have to face that truth. So that was that was fascinating. And then again, just giving them tools that they can take home, they can hide, and when they're ready to quit, they have access to it, but that their parents won't ever see. So some of our overall observations, um, one of the things that we love most about the focus groups, and we found this out with our very first group, was that this gave us an opportunity to have a conversation with youth with no judgment where we can learn from them, but it really became a fluid conversation where they asked us a lot of questions and young people just really appreciated being heard and not spoken at for the whole time. And so they share a lot of information with us. They, every time we do these groups, we always are scrambling to change things after our first focus group because we have such a wealth of um, information that they share in these really valuable conversations that they are trusting us with these stories and with this information. And so we really appreciate them. And we just um, learn a lot from youth and get a lot of really positive feedback about them having an opportunity to share. We also know that young people know about the harms of a lot of these products, but when we dig into the actual harms, they're not actually aware of what the, the true harms are. So that's an important to just keep digging and asking questions. Um, to know their knowledge so that we can get to the root of the information that they, that we should be sharing with young people. Um, as I mentioned, for the last many years, every conversation we have on tobacco ends in a conversation about marijuana. There's a lot of questions about marijuana. There's a lot of misinformation on marijuana. And so we just really need to be equipped in tobacco control to know that when we're talking to teens and to young adults about tobacco, we are also going to be talking about marijuana. So that is that is critical. And then we also have to look at how we do our education and our prevention because when we talk about tobacco, there is an association of danger associated with tobacco, but that same level of danger is not associated with marijuana. But we do have crossover and helping young people understand a blunt, for example, and using a tobacco leaf wrapper is dangerous and that is tobacco use and that can lead to future tobacco use. And so just, again, being equipped with the knowledge and the tools to be able to have those conversations with young people. 
And we just really want to encourage you all to have these conversations with youth. We're happy to share our questions or any of our resources so that you can have those conversations. Um, one of the things that we have seen through our focus groups and we're continuing to see is that not all young people are using the same products and they're not using them all the same way. And so in order to really do our best to have coordinated prevention and treatment at the local level, we really have to understand what our own local issues look like. And that really varies not just by region or by county, but it, it varies very much so by demographic. And so with that, team is working on and we're close to finalizing a series of fact sheets on the different types of tobacco products that are used by diverse youth and young adults, and then also by general population, youth and young adults. And it's our hope that you all um, can really take away from these tools and resources to see what the problem looks like and how we can really narrow in and do our prevention and treatment work um, in California, which is an awesomely diverse state. So I know that we ran a little bit over, but really just appreciate you guys and your interest in this subject and appreciate the work that you are doing to prevent youth and young adult initiation of tobacco and supporting those young people who are using these products and quitting. And here's my contact information. Um, I will, I had some questions asking if the slides can be available. We will make the slides available. We'll put them on our website along with the link to the recording. And then of course, if there's any questions that you guys have, follow up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, also our website, we are working on getting these new resources finalized early in the new year, but also have some existing tools on the site now. Um, I'll stick around online for a few minutes if anybody has any follow-up questions. Again, thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for joining today, and thanks for all of the work that you guys are doing. And a question did just come in about the first webinar and if the slides are on the site. They are not, but we will put them on the, um, the website today. We put PDFs of all of our presentations on the website, but if you guys want the PowerPoint actual slide set, feel free to reach out to me and I can put it in a, a Google Drive for you and email it over. Thanks everyone. Have a great day and a great holiday.